I'm, I am familiar with your background, but it's one of those things where I was familiar with who you were, but I hadn't seen, I haven't ke I've been keeping up with you since your time in the UFC when you started mm -hmm. as an MMA fighter. So how I more or less became reacquainted with you was because when Scott Atkins and James Nunn had uh, released uh, One Shot uh, that came out not too long ago, then I remember when I saw the movie, I had seen your face and you had a very familiar look but I just couldn't pinpoint exactly where I had recognized you from. And then once I'd seen the film and looked into the the cast, then I looked into your background and I realized, oh, you had fought in the UFC way mm -hmm. back in the day, but you fought at 170. And that's why I didn't recognize because you were much bigger in that role. So then from there, I've been somewhat keeping up with your career at that point. Then when I had, because uh, I, I still communicate with Jesse V. Johnson, who he worked with recently for One Ranger. And I actually spoke with him last week as of this recording to help promote with One Ranger here. So... When I had uh, had chance to, to prep to speak with him, he had given me the opportunity to get, get more insight about the more or less the behind the scenes of the making of One Ranger. Mm -hmm. And there's one thing that you had said that I remember that stuck out for me, which then reminded me about one of my favorite scenes in One Shot, which actually is my favorite scene in the entire film. It was a sequence, I should say, not a scene, but it was a line that you had read that more or less kind of gave you an idea for the character that you're that you're playing in One Ranger, called of uh, the character of Oleg. And the line that you had read was, discretion is like calcium in my bones, Ranger. And then right away, you had the idea of what the character was like, considering that more or less he grew up in a rough uh, neighborhood, didn't grow very rich, or I'm sorry, grew up very poor, I meant to say. And then once he had some success in terms of money, then you figured out that this is the guy that would like to more or less uh, dress well, to have people respect him on first sight, and give that perception about who he is as a person. And that's why it was so important for him to come across you know, as this very bravado type of a character. When I had heard that, then I went back to go watch One Shot to re remember what it was about that particular scene that stuck out for me. And, it was, and it's funny because Jesse had said that he did, in, in, the, in the behind the scenes of One Ranger, he didn't specify the film, but I knew which one he was talking about. We said, uh, he, uh, uh, Jesse had uh, done a film with my friend Scott Atkins. And I was like, oh, he's talking about One Shot. So I went back to go watch the movie again. And the sequence that I'm referring to that I, I think is the best part of the entire film. It's not an action sequence at all, but it's a scene with you and your crew. And you have the one soldier that you are pretty much forcing to more or less commit suicide, get the suicide bomber situ uh, scenario there, which lasts about a couple minutes. But that whole entire sequence for me was more or less the heart of the film because that's the conflicting part of your character, which Jesse po uh, pointed out as well too, which I agree 100% with. Which is what I th I thought worked really well for that scene, and then everything else occurred after the fact. At, you know, made a lot more sense, of course. But it was this part of the movie that I remember that you there was a split second where you can see your character conflicted and having to pursue this mission, and having the one person that clearly he does not want to partake in this, but understands the, what the mission at hand is, and is all about the you know whatever the task is in front of him. And as a result of that, he was committed to that despite his personal conflictions. When I saw that sequence, that was a part where I, it was one of those things where I started to realize, I, I, I can't remember if at the time I thought about this here, but I did remember once I heard Jesse say that, that if Jesse caught that and thought what I saw there, I thought he was perfect for Oleg. And he had shared about your preparation and asking the amount of questions you did to prepare for that role and what you had contributed to develop that character which I do think worked out quite well from what I've seen, from which we'll talk in a little bit about here. But I was wondering if at any point, apart from Jesse picking up on that scene that stuck out for him, if anything has changed for you personally in terms of your career that would have benefited from either that film or anyone else who may have seen that sequence that thought how good you had done in that in that part where Jesse thought you were, fit, you were the perfect actor for the part of Oleg, but then if there's anything else after the fact come out as a result of what people may have taken more differently from you, whereas before, because of your look being the heavy, uh, because of your size, I should say, you have a stereotypical role that people would want to stick you in for, but showing a humanity to that character in a very conflicted situation, clearly it had brought someone like Jesse to look at you in a different light. I'm sure he probably noticed that beforehand, but give you more, tell you that you could offer more depth in a, in a film that most likely people would try to just look at it as a as a straightforward action film where the one shot is more or less a gimmick, but the the events that occur in that film has a lot more to the story that definitely builds up to those emotions there. I know I'm going long winded here, but I'm hoping you understand why I wanted to start off with that to more or less give you a press, but at the same time, but I'm just wondering if if you've noticed anything has changed for you along the way 
specifically from that film, because if Jesse had noticed, I wonder if, if anyone else had noticed as well too, where more people were calling you in for possible opportunities to work on more projects of that sort to add more depth to the character that normally you probably wouldn't have been able to play beforehand if it wasn't for that role. Well, there's quite a lot to to unpack there. First yeah. of all, first of all, <clears throat> yeah, I used to fight at 170, and also I even fought at 155 in the UFC. But I always walk around about 205 pounds, so I'm more or less the same size that I was 20 years ago. Okay. Um, now, as for the uh, acting, um, I always wanted to be taken seriously as an actor. Right. Um, so for me, initially, I even hide the fact that I was fighting. I right. didn't even put it on my resume. I won't even talk about it. Obviously, when you come in a room, it's quite obvious with the way I look and my cauliflower hairs. But I really wanted to take serious, to be taken seriously as an actor. In fact, I didn't want to do any small budget movie or anything like that. Um, I really wanted to work with great director and, and prove that I was an actor. And even so, I played very small roles mm -hmm. um, in previous movies before, but I worked with uh, Wim Wenders, who's a very well recognized German director, Wim Pam Do in Cannes. Uh, I acted opposite Helen Mirren. I acted right. opposite um, Alicia McCanders, who won an Oscar two years ago, and I have a monologue opposite her. And none of those parts were with action. They were small parts, but at least I was just acting. So I wanted to prove myself. So I always prepare my role. Uh, like you said, in one shot, none of these things that I've done were written. I was pretty much a heavy in the initial script. I was a straight up terrorist. That's what I was. Right. And after talking to the director, I start rewriting some of my dialogue for two reasons. One, they were big takes. So we would shoot sometimes for seven to 11 minute continuous. Right. So I had to walk from A to B and I didn't have enough dialogue. So initially I said to the director, hey, we need to rewrite some stuff here. And they wrote some stuff and I was not too happy about it. So I took it upon myself to start rewriting some of the dialogue. And when we did rehearsal, the director would look at a page and was like, okay, where's that coming from? I was like, well, I wrote it last night. It was like, that's great. Keep going with it. And then that's when I realized I'm going to change that character. I didn't like the fight that he was a terrorist. I didn't like the idea of it. Um, so I wanted him to be a mercenary. Then all these religious things were for him a way to get soldier for cheap. And inside himself, he was not even religious. He was just a straight up terrorist. So I start rewriting my character like that. And then because he's not a terrorist and he's just for him, he's just for money. When he has to send that kid, I wanted to show another facet of him. Like he has to do it, but really he doesn't want to do it because he's not about that life. For him, it's just a job. But he want to keep thrown in front of his man. Yeah. He doesn't want to lose respect from his man. So he's got to do it. And I thought there is that moment here when I'm not going to have any dialogue, but I'm going to show the audience how I feel about it. And I was hoping that it would work, and it did work. And in fact, at one point, one of the take, when I was holding him by the hand and I looked at him, I had a single tear coming out of my eyes. I was very emotional about it. And the director was very surprised by it. It was like, wow, uh, we didn't realize you could do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, we didn't wrote it that way, but it's great. You bring more layer to this character, which... Right. As I said, initially it was just the AV. So I'm glad that some people seen it. But you know when you do those small budget budget actioner, you don't have many people seeing it. You know, casting director don't watch those movies. Right. Um, big time directors or people are very influential in Hollywood or wherever they might be in Paris or London. They don't watch those small budget movies. So you're lucky if anybody see you and your performance. So I didn't think about it that way. I didn't think I was going to get nothing from it. And when JC contacted me and said, hey, I saw you in that. And I thought you were pretty good. And he offered me the role of Oleg. I was very surprised. Mm. You know, even mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, even the other film director that do B movie, that perhaps something we're going to talk about later on, um, mm. the problem with small budget movies. And a lot of those directors, they're pretty much fans, but a lot of them are not true filmmakers. And they don't really care about the drama. They don't really care about the acting. And in some aspect, they don't even recognize it sometimes. So you try to put a lot of work into it. it just, they just don't care. So, but for me, I wasn't thinking about that. For me, uh, when I do that job, I love what I do. I love acting. I love preparing for a role. I love, I, I love creating those characters. And uh, as long as I was happy doing it, that's it. That's it. What What would happen? What would have happened to you if, um, let's say, if James had told you 
just stick with the script. You know, we're, we're not too concerned about adding the 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 depth of the character. Um, because when you had said that about, because that, that's new to me too. I, I was completely aware of the fact that you actually contributed to that as well, which I'm glad you did because that actually added a lot more to the story, which is, that's the weird dichotomy about that particular character because um, it's the gray areas that are the most uh, conflicted with a lot of people where you understand the motivation, but you don't agree with it, but you understand why they do it. But I'm I'm always curious about someone in your position right now too, because this is something that I actually talked with Jesse about last week. And when we talked about you actually, where he had mentioned before that, because he'd also comes from a stunt background as well, where a lot of stunt act or stunt men who are also asked to do acting in, to some degree, there is a, a there's a slight hesitation because there's, you know, the, the fact that they're working in front of the camera, they can certainly act with what's required. But then if they're asked to do more, can, there's hesitation. Can they actually pull it off? So there's a little bit of like uh, he, I think he described, if I recall correctly, like either a sense of ignorance or jealousy to some degree. But understanding that when Jesse had seen that, it, I'm glad he had done that because. There's, and I'm going to talk about it in a little bit here with One Ridge because there's something really specific about that movie that I really that stuck out for me about your character the most. But, but what I'm wondering for you though is that because of your, because of what you wanted to accomplish with this, I'm assuming that there have been plenty of times where you have been offering some ideas and people have said just stick with what we give you because you know we've got to move quickly or whatever the case may be. But if James had not done that for you, uh, I'm wondering if. How how do you normally handle that for yourself and having someone that would disregard your idea despite the fact that you know it is a good idea? And how have you learned to handle it from when you first had started up to this point now? Because if if James had not listened to you on that, you know, I don't know if the film would have turned out as well, adding that that depth to the character. And I think it still would have been an enjoyable movie, but I don't know if the emotional impact would have been there in the first place if it wasn't for those little touches you've made on there. Or let alone maybe if Jesse had seen the film and saw you didn't do it, it, it you, with what you're trying to contribute and James denied you of that, who knows if that opportunity would ever present it to you in the first place. But again, my my question again was, is how how do you uh, how would you think you would handle that and how have you handled it beforehand? How would you handle it now considering the circumstances you're in right now? Because you're in a position where if, because you're not in, if you're, if you're working with Scott Atkins, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be uh, given the same attention as him, even though you're in the same movie as him, if that makes any sense. So I hope the question just wasn't too complicated, but I hope you understand what I mean by that. I understand what you're saying. First of all, I do not consider myself a stuntman. I'm an actor right. that can do his own stunts. Right. And uh, sometimes I do have stunt coordinator that know that I can act and I know that I, that I can do my stunts. So sometimes they talk to the director and say, hey, we got this part here and perhaps you should have a performer that can actually act. And that gives me opportunity sometimes to be in movies than perhaps I could have been right. before we just down to the casting director because those casting director, if you know, with a big agent, they don't even think of you. So I had plenty of opportunity like that because coordinator know that I can act and I can do my own per stunts. But I never jumped off a building. I've never been put on fire. I've never been hit with a, with a car or anything like that. I just do acting. Maybe I might be hanging on my feet or jump off a wall or doing some fight scene occasionally. But that's as far as it's going to go. Uh, so I never really consider myself a stuntman, but I understand why people can see or say that. Right. Um, the other thing is I work with plenty of directors. I mean, more recently, I work with Gary Gray, Stephen Hopkins. Uh, I, always, I worked a few years ago with Luc Besson. And nobody ever told me, that's not right. Do it another way. Um, not because I'm great. It's just because I come prepare, I read the script and I don't hesitate in what I do. And usually it might even be surprising, uh, but they go with it. I remember working with this film with Luke Besson and I've got one single line in it. But you see me occasionally and when I arrive on set, I realized that I was the only one who wasn't Russian yet I was supposed to be. And all those Russian guys were speaking between each other. So I kind of make it out like, okay, that's my first mission here. And that's why I'm out of, out of the bubble. And these people, they're kind of talking together, but me is my first mission. So I decided from that moment to be kind of hesitating every time I was doing something. So I had to open the, the door to a hand mirror and I was hesitating. But when I was eating a sandwich, I was kind of very messy about it. And it, when it was time to do my scene, Helen Mirren comes into the room and everybody stands up. And I don't because I'm in front of my computer because I'm a bit nerdy. 
And then when she talks to me and complains about something, and I reply to her, it kind of worked because up to that point, I was so um, silly, so out of the bubble. Then when she said a thing and I replied, and she lose a temper against me, it works perfectly. And everybody laughed on set and the director said, that was great, just do it one more time. So my point, what I'm trying to say is, my choice are never random. I think I'm often do the right choice. Now, if a director asks me to do something else, sure, I'll do something else. But then I have to respect the director. And when I work on smaller budget movie, I always want to have that conversation with a director and make sure that we are on the same page. If we are not on the same page, I'm not working on a movie. Now, on a bigger production, I don't always have the choice. If you play a small part and you're a day player, you're never going to talk to the big director. So you got to make your choices and hope that he sticks. And if he asks you to do something else, then you got to do something else. But then if I play a major part in a smaller movie, then it's my skin on the line as well. You know, it's my performance that's going to dictate my future as well. So I'm going to make sure that I'm happy with what I'm doing. So I want a conversation with the director and make sure we are on the same page. And sometime on a day, we might have some disagreement and we need to talk about it. Uh, it does happen sometimes. Right. And 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 uh, once again, my choice are not random. I'm always saying I'm doing this because this, that, and the other. The last thing I want to do is the random henchman that we've seen a Tarzan movie that is in the background that's not coming alive. That thing is part of the furniture. I don't want to do that. You know, if I, if if you want me to do that, I do it in a two hundred million dollars movie, and I'm making a lot of money from it. Now, if I'm taking the time to do a smaller budget movie, and you want me to be a big part of it, then we both need to get something out of it. Mm-hmm. And that's why that initial conversation is very important. That's why when I saw JC, we met here in London. I said, JC, I've got this ID. This guy is always very smart. In fact, he looks like he shouldn't belong there. You know, in some situation, he still got a three-piece suit. And I explained to him why. And I even explained to him how him and Mike Bright met. How did they link up together? Yeah. What was his first reaction? I, I had all this in my head. So like that, when I arrived on set, I know how to behave. I know who my character is. And if he didn't agree with that, then, well, let's talk about it. And let's make this character come alive. If you just want me to be a henchman, maybe I'm not the right guy for you. Me and Jesse nearly worked together a few years back on Avengemen. Uh, my name was put forward by a casting director called Mike Leader. Mm-hmm. And um, I did a tape for him. And I don't think, you know, I think he wanted me to play a small henchman or something like that. And I was not interested. So I'm more happy to say no in some project. If I don't feel like it's for me, I'm just saying no. And it does happen more often than no. You know, in small budget movie when they contact me, I say no, because most of those roles offer me, they don't interest me. As I said, I'm I'm kind of ready to take an L on a big production. And the only reason is that pays my bills. But on a smaller production, when my face is going to be forward and... I'm going to be playing a big role. I want to make sure that I'm, we are both happy with what we're going to do. What's actually um, the the biggest setback for you, though? Because when because you, you, I've heard you talk this before about how you've made some decisions. Of, like for example, you worked on No Time to Die, and the initial mm-hmm. uh, part that you were actually going to have a scene of a fight sequence with Daniel Craig at one point, if yeah, I remember yeah, correctly, yeah. it didn't work out though for one reason mm-hmm. or another. Uh, and you still had a scene in the movie, but not the one you had anticipated for, because these things do kind of change up on the spot. And and you and just how you described before that you have no say in the matter. You just do as you're told at that point. But you mentioned before that because it is a big budgeted film and it's a James Bond movie, you were very happy to do so. Um, but at the same time, uh, I understand the 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 choices that you would make. But when it comes to for example, like if you're if you're being when you're when you get an opportunity to work on James Bond, and then you know obviously they would probably ha- pay you a lot more than you would in a indie film, uh, where you probably have a little bit more say in the matter. But if you are if you're at a position right now where you're taking a role, and it, in this case, like if they see you say you're perfect for a henchman, here's a two hundred million dollar budget film, and we're going to pay you X amount of money for a, amount of, a certain amount of days, you show up with the intention of doing what you're expected to do and all of a sudden like that it's taken away from you. you're still going to get paid but not the way you not doing the work that you anticipated that's the part that i think i'm not really fully understanding about how frustrated it can be for someone in your position that when you're talking to jesse or james about hey i want to change this up a little bit and they're listening to you and they're giving you a, a chance to elaborate and then uh, fine-tune those details 
But when you show up in a massive set like in James Bond, where it just changes up like that and you have no say in the matter there, um, does, there's a, is there a part of it that starts to get a little bit more like, you know, I don't even know if it's even worth it anymore to even just be a part of these productions. I understand it pays my bills, but eventually I'm going to get tired if this is all I'm going to be getting offered here. So maybe I should stick with more roles like when I'm getting offered uh, one Ranger or one shot where I have a bigger role and I can show what I can do. It may take a lot longer for certain people to catch wind, but if the right people catch it, they may that opportunity may present itself. Because in this case, Jesse saw you in one shot and thought you were great and granted you that opportunity. So it's a very tough position for someone, I think, to be in such as yourself. But but again, there's a business decision that you're making, but there's also the personal choices you're making in terms of your art artistry, if you will. So I, I know I'm going long winded, but I'm I'm just wanting to understand like how where do you come to that point where you if you're if you're at a point with yourself right now where if I'm only going to get offered henchman roles in big budgeted films that pays my bill for the rest of my life, am I okay with that, or should I just start from the ground up and just stick with indie films where I have where I can fine tune my skills, but it's going to be a lot harder to pull it off? So I'm wondering where where, you, where that decision part is for yourself at this point. If it was just for the money and the money only, um, I think I would just stop the old acting dream and just become a full time full time stuntman, move into fight coordinating. And then coordinating, and then make thirty to fifty grand a week on a big blockbuster. Yeah. Uh, you know that would be that would be the goal, but that's not what I want to do. Right. Um, so the thing, the other thing is when I say, yeah, he pays the bill, but it's not only that. Um, let me tell you a story. Ten, twelve years ago, uh, when I started in this business, I was doing small short films and working on pop video as a henchman. And uh, what time I did? You know, one of those pop video with a young director, and he thought it was pretty good. It was in the winter; it was very cold. February, everybody had a big jacket. I was my top off. They were like, "Are oh, you okay? Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine." And he thought I was. This guy is really going for it. Uh, I remember, in fact, when I was working in those productions, sometimes people were like, "Are you Jess from the UFC?" I'm like, "Yeah." They couldn't even believe it that I was doing background stuff like that with small videos. But I was like, "I, I want to do this," so I'm ready to start from the bottom. And then this director used me again for another pop video, and then he used me for a short film. And I was playing the lead antagonist on a short film. Now, in the short film, you had a young stunt coordinator. Now, this stunt coordinator over the years, over the past 10 years, grew up. In fact, he was a stunt coordinator in the first gang of London. And then he did a podcast with Scott Atkins. And then after the podcast, when Scott spoke to him, he was like, yeah, I'm, I'm casting Ryan Knight for my next movie. And Jude spoke to Scott about me. And they said, okay, we're going to cast him. And that's how I got a job. Now, what I want to get at is every job you're getting, that's new contact you're going to make, new people you're going to meet right. from the coordinator to young actor to young Networking. filmmaker. And you know as well as I do, this business is all about networking. If you don't have a big agent that have those big contacts, then it's up to, it's up to you to make your own contact. And right now, I don't have a big agent. Big agents are not interested by me. They're not going to be because I'm too old, because I look weird, because I've got an accent. They're not interested whatsoever. So it's, down, it's going to be down to me to find jobs. So, yeah, I'm saying I'm doing it for money, and but that's only part of it. Right. When you work on a big blockbuster, you get more than that. I did a TV show called Liaison a couple of years ago. And initially, I was on it just to do a fight scene and have a couple of lines. And then I arrived and Vincent Cassel arrived. He was like, I can't fight this guy. This guy would beat up my character. It doesn't work. So I just stuck with the dialogue. And then they start taking the dialogue from an actor that was there and giving it to me. Then all of a sudden, I just have a, an acting scene with Vincent Cassel, you know, directed by Stephen Hopkins. How about that? So my point being is st those stunt job, if you want to call them stunt, they give me way too many opportunities. That's how I end up with uh, Gary Gray. I did a film with, um, um, what's his name? Um, uh, young black uh, comedian, um, stand-up guy, very short. Uh, what's his name? Kevin, did Hart. Kevin Hart. Okay. I did a film with Kevin Hart and Gary Gray uh, bring me in. And there was a scene when I was supposed to be hanged by my feet. Uh, so I'm hanged upside down and I'm going through a torture and I have to speak with an Irish accent and, Oh, that yeah, job, yeah. That, 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 and that's coming out in uh, on Netflix in August. And but I got that job through stunts because they say, "Well, we got a great actor, and he can be hanged by his feet all day." So my point being is, that's the reason why I keep doing 
stunt performance or small role and small henchmen. It's just for networking. That's the only reason. Because mm-hmm. the reality is, I don't get that many offers, even small budget movies. Sometimes in small budget movies, they contacted me. They contact me to be henchman number two. And I'm like, what? Because they don't get it. You're like, well, you are henchman number two in that two hundred and fifty million dollars movie. I'm like, yeah, and I made fifty grand on it. You don't have fifty grand, so what, what are we doing here? You know. So you know, you, if you don't have a big agent, it's going to be down to you to 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 do that need walking. And the only way to do need walking is to be on set. I don't believe that you're going to make important people in nightclubs and bars and going to them and say, hey, I'm an actor. No, you're going to meet these people on set and they need to see you on set. They need to see you on camera and say, hold on a minute. I can maybe do something with this guy. Or the director or somebody else that is there. You know, the casting director that was on the Kevin Hart movie contacted me like a month ago for a, a, a superhero movie and asked me to audition for it. I didn't get it, but that person saw me on that set. So what's actually so this is i'm i think i already know the answer to this question but you let me know if i'm leading in the right direction for you because um because you talked before about how when you know when you started fighting the ufc and you actually started fighting around when mma was more or less starting to explode a little bit in the uk because uh, you've been living in london if i recall quite for over 30 years now is that am i right uh, 25 years 25 years okay thank mm-hmm. you so but when you had first started, you know the initial process, was, uh, the initial uh, thought process was that I'm going to be a fighter, and then you were wanting to see how your career would excel in MMA, and then you know you had a pretty good streak in in the beginning with your career, and then things had changed, of course, along the way, and then you started getting into 12 years ago with the acting business. Mm-hmm. But when you, I, I think, if I recall correct, when you said you had got into it because you've always were wanted, you, you, you did want to try acting eventually at one point. But once you started doing it for yourself, um, I'm wondering, you know, what would have changed for you personally in terms of what your intentions were as far as acting? Because, you know, f- for myself, w- when I did want to become an actor, it was for superficial reasons. You know, like I wanted to be rich and famous and I, not understanding the hard work that went behind acting and understand, not understanding that not every actor that's an actor is going to be rich and famous. It's, it's very, very rare that you have the, the cream of the crop that sustained that longevity for their career. Um, I'm not saying that was the case here for you, but when you when you started getting into it, um, was there a perception about yourself about how you looked at the uh, acting game, if you will, that this that made you look at it more differently once you started going through the motions that maybe have would probably have deterred you, or maybe not deter you, but realize that you know the reality of like what it, what it's actually like in the business, and then that's when you really once once you more or less were put into the fire made you realize that this is what I want to do. I, I know for, I, I knew I wanted to do this here, but now that I'm going through the motions, I know for a fact I'm going to keep doing this here because I can see right now this is not going to be easy for me, but I don't care. I'm going to stick with it because there's something about the the, the acting business because I've talked with a lot of people, Jesse included as well, where when he first started making films, not all of his films were being seen. In fact, virtually almost were not being seen in the very beginning. It's not, it, was, it wasn't until like I would say in the last almost 10 years where he started to get a bit of more of momentum. But even then he was doing films before that, but it took a long time for him to get to that point where it's almost guaranteed that whatever idea he may have would be financed. And he will actually get some actors that will want to partake in his work too, because of his reputation. But knowing that for yourself, when you started experiencing that, um, did you have a little bit of a hesitation of once you started seeing that the hard work that's involved, not just with acting, but just the, the grind of having to go through with it um, and if it, if it deterred you, what kept you in it? And then, or if you never felt that, 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 um, that hesitation, but I'm wondering because it's such a hard business, uh, why do you still do it? Because it's not for the faint of heart. And you pointed out before that you have to make choices that are going to help you financially, but at the same time, there's networking that's involved as well too. So it's a constant grind. You're having to push through it all the time. And I can, I, I would imagine some people may not be aware of it too, but it can wear you out after a while. So I'm un, I want to understand that part of, of your psychology because I think a lot of it from your fighting days may have helped out with that as well too. But there's a different aspect of that grind that's different from fighting that acting uh, offers as well too that I think some people, even fighters as well, may realize ah, this is not for me. So I'm curious about what your perspective was in yourself in the beginning and how you've been able to maintain that despite the hard road ahead of, uh, that's coming up for you, not knowing what this, what the future is going to hold for you, despite the fact that 
there's a chance it could work out, but there's also a great chance that it could not work out at, at any moment's notice here. Uh, first of all, I always wanted to be an actor since I was 14, 15 years old. Right. Um, I was uh, homeless when I was 14. I had a pretty tough childhood and I had a job in a video store. So I was watching a lot of movies. I was like, okay, this is what I want to do. But one thing you might not know is I never wanted to become a fighter. I started martial arts when I was eight. I started competing at 16. And for me, I wanted to see if my technique were efficient. I wanted to test my martial arts skill initially. So that's the only reason I wanted to fight. And then you do one more fight, one more fight, and then very quickly you become popular because I like action movie. I like the techniques used in action movie. And now I'm using them also in fighting. So you're very entertaining. So you get more offer, more offer. And then eventually you're like, okay, now I'm not fighting to test my skills anymore. I'm using the ring or the cage uh, as if it was a stage for theater. And I want the audience to vibrate. And But I never wanted to become a champion. I always wanted to be entertaining. For me, winning was not the ultimate goal. I wanted to entertain people. And at one point here in the UK, um, um, my life took over. I went from making a three pound an hour as a kitchen porter to work as a personal trainer. So instead of making 25 pound a day, I was making 25 pound an hour. So that took my focus and I was concentrating a lot more on doing personal training, a lot less on training. So my career was going up and down, up and down. I was not winning as many fights. I was winning one, losing one. And I lost my focus. And then at one point I was like, okay, let's finish on a good stretch and now focus on my training. And I beat up a few good guys and I got signed up by the UFC. Right. But it just kind of happened from nowhere. So when I was in the UFC, I was like, let's keep up with that. So I beat up some guy. I lost some. When I came out of the UFC, I went through a, a big winning streak. But the UFC didn't want to sign me up at that point so because I was too old. So it was like, mm. hold on a minute. I never wanted to become a fighter. And I was pretty successful. How about I try to become an actor? I mean, I know it's going to be hard, but hey, it can't be harder than fighting. So I started going to acting classes. I was like, I love this. This is fun. And there's two things here. First of all, I never go into acting for fame and money because I had not necessarily money, but at least I had fame in a fighting game. And that may, never made me more happy. I thought it would because I never really had a childhood because I never really had a father. So I thought that getting the love from the audience, from the fan, is going to make me happy. But I realized that it didn't. So fame for me was not very important anymore. It was when I was younger because I thought it would make me happy, but now I realized it's not. So I never go into acting for fame. I go into acting because I love acting. I love, like I said, that's why I don't want to take those jobs if I'm not going to be able to create a character and act and do what I love because that's what I want to do. The ultimate goal is not to see myself on screen and post this, post this on social media and I have a million followers. I don't give a shit about that. No, what I want is acting. The most important day for me is the day we're going to act, is the preparation creating all of this character and on the day when we hear and we say action and I'm doing it and when it's a cut I see the director and he's very happy what I do that's the magical moment because afterwards you don't even have control you don't even know what's going to be shot how it's going to be shot how it's going to be edited and how it's going to be released and how it's going to be received you have no control over that so you might as well enjoy the day when you're acting and for me that's what's important and the day I don't enjoy that anymore that's the day I should move on into do something else. And I always knew I was going to swim against current. I always knew. I started in this business. I was nearly 40 years old. I was not a kid anymore. And I lived through a lot of shit in my life. So I was aware of the politic. I was aware that in this game, there's a lot of privileged people. And they don't want people coming from the outside. I knew all of that. I'm not silly. But I didn't realize how even more political it was going to be. Um, so... Sometimes this is what kind of like upset me a little bit and kind of, you know, but as long as I'm enjoying it, as long as I'm making fun on sand, I'm going to keep doing it. The day it's not fun anymore and I'm feeling like, okay, this is just become annoying now. I'm just going to move on and do something else. You know, there's something that you had said that actually, um, I've never heard this, uh, this analogy before. You talked about how the, in this case, like the octagon on the ring was your stage and the audience there were more or less like the movie going out, if you will, because you're putting on a show. I'd never heard that concept before. That's actually quite interesting you pointed out because 
this is the one thing that I I'm gonna I want to give you your uh, your your flowers into this here because one of the things that I remember um, in listening to when you talked about the the making of uh, One Ranger uh, and Jesse pointed out as well too and I, I started noticing it more once I'm watching the film and I went back to go watch One Shot at, where the he mentioned and you discuss you just discussed it as well uh, earlier to, uh, with regards about your preparation for your character in One Shot but. The the amount of questions you happen to ask, Jesse was like was really uh, clearly shown that you were very invested to to prepare for this character. He talked a great deal about that for for what happened at watch in the behind the scenes. And the reason one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you is because um, there was essentially what I what I like to look for is the the hidden gems, if you will, where you find some something in somebody that they they've done something that maybe most people tend to look over to a degree but they may remember some little aspect of what what the person did in the movie and then they will move on with their day and then when someone else brings it up they will remember oh yeah i remember that scene cuz it stuck out for them but but for me i always find the the hidden gems because I, I i like to root for more or less the underdogs the people that stick with the grind despite the fact it's a very hard endeavor they're they're following through this here and for whatever reason, they still stick to it despite the highs and lows. Probably more lows than highs, but when the highs are there, it's almost like we're very it's very rewarding and it's very satisfactory. But then just like that, it goes away. And I always find people like that to be the most interesting because I always figured out that if they if they're doing it because they love it, then there's no money in the world that will equal to that that satisfaction of why they do it in the first place. So what leads me to my question with you is because uh, I find your story to be rather interesting for a number of different reasons here. But the one thing that stuck out for me the most was, quite frankly, is really the um, the dedication to the craft. Because I think I had a there's a lot of times I tend to have a, a misconception of certain things just out of ignorance because I just don't know any better. Because there's there's so many facets to the industry when it comes to. Um, in this case, like Kane Hodder, who is known for playing Jason, you know, the, his his intention was to be a stuntman, and then because he played Jason, he became known for playing the character, and then he started getting acting roles as a result of that as well too throughout his career, and it had maintained a pretty steady career, but that was never the intention in the first place. So, and then when you come to find out that there are several different uh, stuntmen as well that have started from the ground up like David Leach and of course uh, Chas Stahelski who are known for the John Wick films and of course what David Leach has been doing since then uh, but they were not you know offered these great opportunities they are now they had to work to get to that point but they come from a background that most people tend to overlook which is the stunt work because the one thing I, I, I always point out with people when it comes to making films in general is that the details that are involved in making those movies and that's something that I think Chas Stahelski has done phenomenal when it comes to the John Wick films but at the same time what when people point out that they're stuntmen, that to me is the important part because they understood the hard work that goes into making those films. Where sometimes I think lately, when I was in the last twenty years, where these quick edits are, are I think do a disservice to a lot of action films. But the people that understand what what it takes to make those and their uphill battle to have to prove why they want to pursue this this vision, if you will, where people are taking this step back to say, well, we don't have to do it this way. We can just do it like this and save money. And they have to say, no, we do it like this to save money. So I'm going off on a tangent here, but what, the, what I'm pointing out with you is that the same set of details that I happen to notice that these directors are focusing on to bring the best out of the product is what I happen to notice in you as well, too, when it comes to the preparation that, that Jesse had pointed out before about your your for your character in, uh, of Oleg in one shot, I'm sorry, in one ranger, excuse me, and then listen to what you had said before about your preparation for your character in, in one shot. Um, that's and, and the reason why I, I want to highlight that for you is because to me, it, if if I if I happen to catch that one little piece of uh, character moment in one shot, I always I remember specifically thinking, especially when I watched the film back again after watching Run Rangers, like imagine if he had if that entire film was never an action film, it was just it was just a dramatic piece where the entire film was just that. The film would have probably worked out just as well, if not better. With and not to say the action scene didn't make any better, it definitely did it do its purpose. But if it was just a straightforward dramatic film, the fact you were able to carry that, I think, says a lot about your your delivery and the performances here. So again, I'm going long winded, but what I'm what I'm wondering with you now is that I'm not sure if you go back and actually watch your films that you partake in, and if you do, um, 
do you look at are you one of those actors that has a hard time watching yourself or do you actually look at it and see what you've done to what did I do good here and what did I didn't do well so I can improve on the said um, performances in the future uh, roles I may have down the line here because I've met quite a few actors that are very adamant about not wanting to check out their work. It's done for them. They're able to move on. Some are a little bit more in depth where they want to take the time to pick apart and then see what they can improve on from there. I want to know your position on that because if you do take the time to do that, from my perspective, it seems like you would actually look back at your work to say, okay, what did I do really good here so I can improve on that? And where did I fail here so I can improve on that? Uh, uh Usually watch the film I've worked on once, at least once, you know, okay. to have an idea of the way I've done it. You see, uh, and if it's bad, I'm like, oh, no, I'm not watching that again. I'm not watching the rest of it. Uh, on the day, I'm not. On the day, I'm focusing on what I do. I never go and look at a combo and, you know, look at myself on the playback or anything like that. I'm in right. the moment. I know. Because if you do that, sometimes you, you might just say, oh, no, that's terrible. And that is going to stick with you. Or you imagine you say, oh, actually, that was fun when I did that. But that's something you did naturally. You can't do it again, you know. So I rather not watch it. I only watch the combo when I'm doing fight scene. But when I'm doing acting, I'm in, I'm in the moment. And if something is not working, the director is going to tell me a bit more like this, a bit less like that. And then I don't would do it. Um, so, but when the movie did get released, I watched myself once, and I don't move on. You know, it's it's no point. You know, as I said. For me, the moment was to do it on a day. So I would hope that if it wasn't working, someone would tell me that it's not working. And uh, and usually I'm I, I kind of, I think I kind of make the right choice because, yeah, I love acting, but I'm guessing like you, definitely like Jesse, uh, first and foremost, I'm a movie lover. So mm -hmm. I love movies with everything he has to offer. I notice every little thing, every frame, the light, the color, um, what was in the table in the background, the way the people behave, everything. So when I'm on set, I, I, I'm aware of all of that. So when I get on set, I'm looking around, what's on the table? What can I play with? What's going on here? How many extra there is? Is there a piece of paper I can take at some point? You know, and make sure that it's organic. Maybe on a day I might not do it. In one shot, at one point, I'm very pissed off. I'm, you know, very frustrated. I'm walking back. I'm doing it a couple of times. And I'm like, ah, I'm not doing very much. And then I'll go and see a, a, an, an extra that was there. And I was like, you know what? Next time I come here, you see me coming. Just start bringing your head up like, uh, like that. And I'm going to shoot you in the head. And then just do a reaction. It was like, oh, okay. So the extra was very happy and it was part of the action. And I did it. I came. He came. Uh, I was like, shut the fuck up. Bam, boom, shooting in the head was down. Because I was frustrated. And he walked. And then after I see the replay, because someone was filming it on the phone and he showed me after that. And he had one of the producers that was jumping around in the background because they liked what I was doing. So I'm very aware of what's going on. I want to play with what's what's around myself. Um, because I love movie. I love I, I love those little things sometimes that make us remember movies. Sometimes it's just one scene. Yeah. And we're more than willing to rewatch the old movie yeah. to get to that scene. Yeah. Or sometimes it's one frame, one single frame that's printed in our mind. And we're going to think over and over. When you think about that movie, is that single frame that comes in my head. So every single frame in the movie is very important. And if someone gives you the opportunity to be in one frame, a one frame only that can be in someone's mind, you're going to make the most of it. It's, it's, it's so precious. That's why sometimes people come to me and say, oh, we don't see you very much in that movie or you don't have very much dialogue. First of all, they don't understand how hard it is to be in that movie. And for them, I'm like, dude, every little frame in that movie is important. Every little second is important. The part, I mean, um, the fact that I'm part of it for me, it means something to me. It might not mean something to you, but it means something to me. And if in that frame I'm doing the right thing, either in a forefront or in a background, I'm just happy to be part of it. You know, there's something that I'm, I remember you discussed before uh, with regards to your preparation. And there's there was something that I think someone had asked you about this, if I recall correctly. And let me know if I'm wrong. But because uh, when I'm hearing you talk, you still have your French accent. Yeah. And and you mentioned before about the the role that you got for the Kevin Hart film that's coming out later this year, where you had to put on an Irish accent. Yeah. So there's there's one thing that you had said before that I remember, uh, where I I can't remember if if it was asked of you or if you brought it out to that. I don't remember, but I, I think I how I recall was it was asked of you if um, because you've been living in the UK for in this case the last twenty five years that if you have ever developed a more or less a UK accent because you still keep your French accent and you said that now I'm going to keep my accent. 
Uh, and what I think you said jokingly, but you were saying because, you know, it has a little bit of sex appeal to it. But that being said, though, uh, I always find it very interesting for actors because there's certain accents that I think certain actors just have a hard time, you know, transitioning from one accent to the, to another accent, like Southerners. Um, Southern actors, I, I've, I've come across, have a very hard time putting on more or less a straight, let's say, American accent. But they can put on other southern accents because it's easy to kind of just move navigate through the 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 mm -hmm. muscles, if you will. But then I, I remember when I saw um what was it? Eastern Promises with Vincent Castle and Viggo Mortensen. And it dawned on me when I was watching the film that uh that Vincent was playing a Russian, but he's French. When you hear him speak, he has a very thick French accent. Mm -hmm. And now I, I don't have a really good ear for the Russian because I'm not around a lot of them, but I pick up enough to understand that he did his due diligence to prepared to get the accent down right and then when he spoke russian i don't know how accurate it was when it came to speaking the language but it sounded to me it was pretty on point at least from my perspective but when i heard you say that you're gonna be putting on a irish accent you having a french accent and a thick one at that too i'm not sure how difficult it is for you to be able to uh, to prepare for that because you've been around in the uk for 25 years at this point i'm sure you're surrounded by a lot of irish people a lot of scottish a lot of obviously english people so I'm sure that the accent may kind of sink in a little bit. We can kind of understand the lingo for a little bit, but to actually put it on, I'm not sure how difficult it is for you to actually transition from one accent to the next. Where I think, where I, when you played um, in what was the movie that you play a Russian? I can't recall. Oh, it might have no. It was in One Ranger. You played a Russian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so I'm uh, Ukraine. I'm Ukrainian. Yeah, Ukrainian One Ranger. Yeah. So having to put on more or less a Ukrainian accent for that role, I would think that that would probably be a little bit easier to do. But putting on an Irish accent, a distinct one at that, might be a little bit more difficult. So I'm wondering, uh, in throughout the years, how how has that been for you? Is it easy to transition to that, or does it take a long time for you to develop that accent to actually get it down right, where you feel comfortable in pulling it off? I think sometimes for accent, you need to find that single key. There's a key, and right. you need to find that key. But right. when you got it, click, hey, everything's open up. Yeah, I remember <laughs> the first time I was asked to do a Russian accent. Uh, someone asked me to come down for an audition. Uh, it was a fighting audition. And uh, it was for a film with uh, Dev Batista that he shot in the UK. I think one of his first leaves called um, one, uh, Final School, I think it was called. And uh, I came, I did the audition, the fighting, and it was like, yeah, great. And the director comes up and says, oh, we're thinking about Jess to play that part. It was like, okay, let's do the lines. I was like, what lines? So he gave me the lines. He said, okay, great. Now do them with a Russian accent. I'm like, uh... I don't know how to do a Russian accent. So he said, okay, walk on it and then come back. And I was trying to do it. And I sounded <laughs> Indian. You know, I, was, I didn't know how to do an accent. <laughs> so uh, I went home and I walked on it. So I was listening to a lot of Russian politicians because funny enough, Russian politicians do have very thick accent. Right. So I started walking on it. But by the time uh, I kind of walked on it, they gave the role to somebody else, uh, my good pal Lee Charles, who play, uh, who play my right-hand man in, in one shot. So, um, but then I had a lot of the audition um, for Russian henchmen or Russian gangsters. So I started working on it. And surprisingly, it came to me very easily. Uh, now I have a coach now that I called. So um, I'm doing it by myself. And then I call my coach and I do a few sessions with him so we can sharpen up bits and pieces. That's what I did for one ranger and my Ukrainian accent. Uh, some accents are easier than others. Uh, now I'm going to get back to the accent later on because there's accent that you can do for an international audience or a British audience and uh, accent that you do for American audience, which is even more different. Because nice. it's not just an accent. It's, it's just American. Doing accent for America, you have to sound still American. If not, most Americans don't understand it. So, for example, when I was doing my Ukrainian accent on One Ranger and we shot in the UK... Everybody could understand me. The only day I did it with an American guy, he couldn't understand a single word I was saying. He kept to me, he said, excuse me, uh, I don't understand what you're saying. <laughs> so sometimes you have to do a Russian accent, but with an American kind of rhythm, I see which, saying. which goes against the way Russian speaks. It's not natural, but that's what people do sometimes in American movies. So as for Irish accent, it came to me fairly easily because it's very singing. Um, the Irish was telling me that English people will find it hard to do an Irish accent because English is very flat. As for Irish, it's very ups and down. It's kind yeah. of a sing song. And I kind of got into it. And it's funny you are mentioning Southern accent. 
I'm terrible with American accent, but I haven't really worked on it, to be honest with you. But when I tried Southern accent, like Texas or New Orleans, right. I kind of got the gist of it, the rhythm of it. Right. But I can't do New York or I can't do Boston or, or, or LA or California. I can't do that at all. I'm sure if I worked on it, I can perhaps can. But uh, the Southern one, I find it much easier. But sometimes it comes with, Listen, you got actors who've been working in Hollywood for 30 years and they still can't do an American accent. I mean, Arnold is one of them, but even mm-hmm. Antonio Banderas, when he does American accent, you can hear it. Uh, um, what's his name? Um, Jason Statham. You can hear that his American accent is not quite on point. Yeah. So they're not easy to get, especially, I think, when you come from a Latin background. I mean, if you're Spanish or if you're French or something like that, it's much harder compared to if you are, come from a Germanic background. Uh, like German or Swedish, most Scandinavian can do a very good American accent. Yeah, I think so too. Or, or even um, Belgium, but not on the French side, on the other side, yeah. which is Flemish, which is yeah. closer to Germanic. Um, so basically, yeah, I, I can do accents, some easier than others. And but American, yeah, I really struggle. And and most agents they ask you to have an American accent, and that's the problem now. I think with a lot of agents, they have all those young kids, and they basically want them to be Swiss knives. So they're like, uh, oh, can you do British, you know, posh accent? Or can you do a Cockney accent? Or can you do a New York accent? Or can you do an LA accent? A lot of young kids they can do all of that, but there's one thing: a lot of them can't act for shit. <laughs> so it's great. No, I mean, how many TV shows have you seen recently or, 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 or films? And they can do all those great accents, but the acting is not very good. It's kind of not great. It's, the reason being is very simple. They're young kids. You know, most actors take them 10 to 15 years to break in. So not only they learn about the craft, but also they learn as a, as a human being, as a person. They can, right. they can look back on their own personal experience to be able to play certain... And now I see a lot of very young actors. I'm like, this is very flat. I feel like they're acting if they were like they were in a 90s sitcom. You know, they go to this gimmick. You know what I mean? They know yeah, what saying. face to do when they have to be sad or surprised. Mm-hmm. The kind of the kind of the kind of tools mm-hmm. that they go in the back pocket. But I don't really feel that like they're living the moment. I'm not saying all actors are like that. Right, right. You know what I mean? I'm just I'm just generalizing here. The whole point I'm trying to say is sometimes those agents, they literally want you to be a Swiss knife and have all those different skills when really you should be first and foremost about acting. Do you still think in French or do you think in English now? I think in English. Okay. But when I when, to so, speak French sometimes, I've got to tr- quickly translate it in my head. So when you speak French, uh, is it, I mean, because you obviously speak, speak it fluently because I've actually been, I don't speak French, but I have, when I come across some interviews, you, they, you were speaking French and you actually yeah. spoke it quite, uh, like, you know, pretty consistently all across the board. Yeah. But I'm wondering though, because you've been living in the UK for, you know, for over 25 years at this point, um, you know, France is not far at all from the UK, but I'm wondering, you know, because you've been living there for such a long period of time and traveling around, um, I would think, at least from my perspective, that it's almost hard to escape from it because I'm sure you're going to come across various people who are from France, or other parts of the world that speak French, that you may come across. I mean, you worked with Vincent Castle. I'm sure you may have spoken with him in French at some point on set. But when you, but when you're around these various sets you're, that you that you're working on here, I'm sure there's somebody out there that does speak French that you are going to come across, and it's almost hard to escape from having to speak it because you're always constantly around it. But the fact that you're constantly thinking in English, um, does it is it hard for you to get back into it, or is it just an easy transition from point A to point B without skipping a beat? No, it is easy transition. I think it's a bit like uh, if you um, if you if you let's say in Mexican, you've been even growing up in America. I think mm-hmm. sometimes when you're going to speak uh, Spanish, you're going to have the odd English word, an American word that's going to pop in there. Or yeah. sometimes you 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 do it the other way around. You speak it uh, like an American, but really that. That, that saying doesn't really exist in Spanish. Yeah. You're just kind of translating. Yeah, I know. You know. What you're so, uh, but for the most part, yeah. <laughs> for the most part, it, sometimes it also it takes me a little bit of time. You know, if I spend one day in France after my first day and all those French languages and all of right. this comes in my brain, then I go back in cruise control. Then, but it's the initial time when you start speaking to people a little bit. It's not difficult, but sometimes you need to readapt. But yeah, that's so, one thing that I don't like is when I'm on set, there's another French person because they feel the need to speak to you in French all the time. You right. know, you feel like you're both speaking French. Everybody's looking at you like, what is those guys saying? So yeah. I'm, I'm trying not to speak French with other people, you know, when they, when they're on set. 
Do you still have an accent uh, when you speak French or is your accent kind of watered down a little bit? Um, people say that when I speak French, I've got a weird uh, accent. But I think the reason being is sometimes it's not the accent. I think sometimes it's the rhythm. And also that I need to readapt after a couple of days is fine. But also, as I said, is those expressions that we have in English that we don't have in French. Right. And I tend to say, you know, even so we have, uh, it's very hard to explain. Obviously the vocabulary is different. It's right. more than we use in English that even exists in France. But no, I know, know what you're saying. Cause you know, them. I, I speak, cause I speak Spanish as well too. Yeah. And, and Spanish was my first language. And then once I, cause, cause I was born here in the States, but when I went to school, that's when I first started to learn to speak English. And then for a number of years, because I know exactly what you're talking about here, speaking Spanish for uh, for a number of years and then speaking English and then going back to speaking Spanish, my brain is wired now that I'm speaking American, but I'm speaking Spanish in the American fashion and it doesn't yeah. have the same rhythm with it. So and, and, I, and I used to get confused why I said the words correctly, but the way the connotations, the the placing of the words and how the words are used doesn't didn't translate for me uh it, it took a long time for me to figure that out but then again no one ever told me that i was saying it wrong it's just like okay and they kind of went off and for years i went saying the, the wrong thing for you know for a long time even my parents would would ever tell me that i was saying it wrong to begin with until someone else would so i understand with what you mean by that but but i guess what what i'm what i'm curious yeah. about with you is that um if if someone if if you had an opportunity to work on uh, to take a role and it's entirely in french um would it be a situation where, let's say, if they told you, you know, we need you to put on a, uh, you know, we need you to speak French, but we need you to put on a specific French accent? Do you think that would be easier for you to transition and putting on a specific uh, accent from a region, as opposed to in this case having to put on an Irish accent, which maybe you know, you said it was easy to transition to, but but putting on a French accent, I think, would be a little bit more easier, but a specific type, would that be a little bit more difficult for you? Um Yes and no. I think it wouldn't be as difficult because your brain, just, you don't have to think. You know, when you speak you, your own language, you don't have to think about articulating properly or anything like that. You will right. speak a lot more naturally. So uh, it's one thing you don't have to think about. Um, you can also speak much faster. Or you can even improvise. Um, but the only, I think it would be more difficult than I would be a lot harder on myself. Now, I said that I did an Irish accent on uh, that movie, but I don't know how good that Irish accent was. You know, a lot of people around me saying, yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's fine. You know, <laughs> but really, if I was Irish, I would be listening to myself and say, fuck it, yeah, this is shit. <laughs> you know, it's the same with um, Peaky Blinder. Uh, the people around the world think that, you know, the accent is great, uh, even in London, because they're from Birmingham and they think, well, the accent is good. But I've heard a lot of people from Birmingham saying, ah, it's terrible. It's not good. So, you know, That's so me being French, <laughs> me being French, me being French and obviously knowing the other accent, I right. would be a lot more aware of it and I would be a lot more worried to not overdo it. Because that's why I hear sometimes French people, like, for example, a French actor from Paris, and they try to do a southern French accent. Sometimes it's always OTT. It's always too much. It's always caricatural. So I would be a lot more aware of that. than when I'm doing it uh, in a different language, I don't think about it. And most accents are caricatural. I mean, let's face it. Most people, when you do East European, it does sound... Oh, most English people and American people, when they do a French accent, it's very often caricatural. And sometimes mm -hmm. it doesn't really sound right. It's like, oh, that word, that word was fine, but that word, no, our French people would have not said it that way. They all sound like Inspector Clouseau. <laughs> what about when it comes to, um, I mean, do you, do you have like any hesitation on w w wanting to put on any accent? Because you talked before about putting on an American, which is what you said is an accent is very difficult for you to do. Yeah. But let's say if, an, if it's an opportunity where, um, it's a role that you that you were dreaming of, like a really hard, you know, good character role that offers a lot of emotions, a lot of uh, emotional depth to the character. We think you're great for the part, but you got to put on an American accent. Yeah, um, sure. I mean, listen, I would do it now if I, you know, it would take time, money, dedication. And here's the reality. Uh, I just changed agent recently and... Uh, with my agent for the past six years, I think I do through my agent, I do an average of two to three audition a year. That's it. Two to three audition a year. 
So I would spend all that time and that money. I'm not sure it would get me more audition. Now, I, I think that if I can do an American accent, making I can double or triple that. So maybe I can get 10 auditions a year. Uh, but is that really going to make the difference? It's um, also my age, my height. There's so many things. So it would require a lot of investment for me. Uh, and I'm not sure at the end of it, it would pay off. I'd rather spend my time focusing on my craft and be the better actor I can be at this moment instead of trying to play those things. But if I get offered a role or if I have the opportunity to play a good role, it doesn't even have to be a, a leading role, but a role that I'm very happy about. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to spend so many days, so many weeks to prepare for this and do an American accent. Yeah, of course I would do it. And I, I'm sure I'd be fine. There's something that, because you we, you talked about Dave Batiste before, about a, a role that you auditioned for with him, but it, there was something that I remember he had said and, and I'm I'm going back with you on this here because he was talking about uh, when he auditioned for uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, he said that the casting director had pointed out, like you know, this guy Lee Pace who played Ronan the uh, the Accuser in the first film. Uh, he's like, this guy's amazing. He's gonna he's gonna do some great things. He can do anything, and so on. And but uh, Dave was talking about like you know, I, I remember that, and I, and I said that's the guy that I want to be. I want to be the guy where people will say this guy is really good at what he's doing right now, and he's gonna be. He's gonna do some amazing things. Like I want to be that guy, and you know, and Batista Dave, I'm sorry, but they had made some really conscious decisions to avoid taking on roles that would more or less put him in the more or less the stereotypical type of roles that big guy doing all these uh, these standard things like The Rock and whatever and whoever else. And then he recently had just come out with the movie um, Knocking the Cabin Woods, where it's not an actual role; it's the most dialogue he's ever given in a role, and it's a very emotional. Uh, a character-driven role, and he felt like it was one of his best performances. But what was interesting is that when it came to that character, I guess, I've never read the book in which the movie is based off of, but apparently the character was described as being this massive individual who was very uh, emotional at the same time. And the mass, it was just like a, a characteristic rather than the actual personality, if you will. But what's interesting for me about you is because I remember at one point you talked about it in a previous interview that you had said that, um, you know, you you were considering losing a little bit of the weight because, you know, the muscles, I mean, the, the joints aren't going to be able to hold up the weight like you used to before. And at the same time, you also believe, I think if I recall correctly, that by slimming down a little bit, maybe would grant you a little bit more opportunities where they're not going to look at you as this big guy who's going to do these tough roles, but rather more um, roles that would give you more opportunities to show your acting skills. I'm sure I mean, that's still the case here for you, but there's a part of me that's wondering how things have changed for a lot of people when it comes to directors and writers that are more or less coming into the mainstream, if you will. They're, they're casting actors that are not known for their standard roles. They're, they're not known for these roles they're being casted for now under these uh, more or less uh, filmmakers, if you will, where they would be stereotyped as a certain type of uh, character. And then you have guys like James Gunn's, and you also have guys like Quentin Tarantino's who are just giving opportunities to guys that I remember you from this role. You play these type of roles. I'm going to give you an opportunity to do these type of roles, but this is nothing I'm I'm accustomed to doing because they all people see me like this. I don't care. I know you can do well because I saw one movie that you did where you did this, and I'm going to give you that chance for you to do all of that in one film. It seems like the the times have changed where we're getting more filmmakers like that that are giving more opportunities. Like James Gunn is an example I think that had listened to you. And gave you the opportunity to show some real character with, uh, with your with your role in one shot, and I'm only thinking in time that's going to completely change where that's not going to be part of the stigma anymore for guys such as yourself, Dave Batista, where you're a big guy, but you don't have to play the tough guy. You can play the dad who just happens to be a big guy, more or less. Do you think, from your perspective now, because I understand there's a lot of politics behind the business, but do you think that it's going to change to the point where if the opportunity were to come where someone like yourself can go and audition for a dad and they're going to look at you and say, okay, yeah, just let's see what you can do and not worry about your size, your look, but rather can he just act? Do you think it's going to come to that point where that will be able to happen, where the stigma is not going to be part of the, the concerns anymore? 
First of all, Dev Batista is Dev Batista. I mean, I remember Dev Batista when he started in the movie business and some yeah. of the movie he was doing in his early career won't yeah. <laughs> won that great. But the, the, those, the, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the thing with Dev Batista is a multimillionaire. So he can take his time. He doesn't have to work. You know, he can have a good PR agency. Every little role that he's going to do, as little as they are, he's going to have a great PR that's going to put him forward and say, look how fantastic he is in this movie. Um, so like when he did in... Um, Blade Runner, for example, I think he looked great in Blade Runner. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if it would have been any other actor, nobody would have remembered that role. It's just because it's him and he does have that money and he can obviously use the PR company to kind of put him forward and say, Hey, look what I can do. And that's great for him. Now I'm not him. If I right. play a good role like that, nobody cares, you know. So that's the third thing. Uh, the second thing is, yeah, the big guy thing is the same as, um, the reason that people in history say, Oh, we don't want this guy because he's a stuntman and stuntman can't act, right. uh, which doesn't make any, any any sense. But, you know, you will say, well, this guy's a wetter, so why can't he act? But the reality is they don't want him either, you know, and they don't want the big guy. They don't want this. The, the reality is in Hollywood, there's some people, they don't want anybody else from the outside. They want their people to get the job. So they're going to find any opportunity to say, not him, not her, because whatever. You're too big, you're too short. You're too dark, you're too this, whatever. So when I realized that, I kind of stopped caring about my size because I was kind of starving myself to try to be as small as possible. And what happened at that time is I wasn't getting more audition anyway. And then for the role to play the tough guy or whatever, I wasn't getting those either because I was not quite as big, as impressive anymore. So I kind of like, you know what? I'm going to be who I want to be. You know, like I said to a casting director before, I'm like, why can't I be a dad? Why can't I be a dad that just play rugby or something like that? Especially with my cauliflower here. What I got to do is one scene is just take my rugby jersey, put it on the floor or whatever, and that's it. The, the audience is going to understand how I play rugby. But the reason is, it's not that. It's not because I'm big. It's just because I don't have the right agent. That's the reason why I can't do the audition. It's that simple as that. So when you start understanding the politic, either you can be upset about it or you make peace with it. And you're like, okay, I don't care about these people. They don't care about me. Whatever job I'm going to get, I'm going to do the best of my ability. So like you said, a young film director, man or woman, from independent cinema can say, hey, I saw that guy. Like Jesse did. And I'm like, mm-hmm. I like that guy. I want to give him a job. And and the moment right now we're having is, and that's another subject matter we can get more into depth. Um, there's great opportunity right now for a small budget movie because I think the audience is getting very tired of those big blockbusters that all look the same mm-hmm. and they're looking for something new. A lot of kids that were 12, 15, now they're 22, 25. They've seen those movies for 10 years, yeah. most of their life. They want to see something else. And that's the reason why Squid Game was popular, RRR was popular, mm-hmm. or Everything Everywhere All at Once. Those movies are completely different. And that's the reason why people are like, hey, we want to see that. We want something new. So I think now in a small budget world, in the independent cinema, we have the opportunity to offer something new to the audience and say, hey, we're here and have a new audience. And not only that, but they would give opportunity to young filmmaker and your actor like myself. That this movie coming out, which just came out last week called Sisu. And everybody's yeah. talking about it. Sam, small budget movie. and everybody's like, So I think now there's this great opportunity now for all of us to shine in a small budget market. The problem is, is people are ready to put their money where their mouth is. And, and that's another subject matter we can talk about is when you see a $250 million movie, I would say a third of it, the money disappeared, you don't know where. Friends, you know, assistants, flights, business flight, you know, jets here and there, you know, a good 50 to 70 million dollar movie disappears. Um, and a lot of it really goes to people that don't even need to be there in the first place. So realistically, those movies cost about 100 million at best. Uh, and we do have the same problem in small budget movies. Sometimes when it's a movie cost 5 million, you're lucky if you actually got two to make that movie. It's about $3 million, you don't know where it went. And obviously, when you try to do a movie with $2 million, there's not very much you can do, especially when initially you were supposed to get five. Now you need to readjust the movie. If at least you knew from day one you were going to get two, then you're just readjusting your script. So it, you try to look the best it can be. But now I think what's happening is a lot of those movies, 
You're not really getting your money, you were promises. And now you're just like, oh, how are we going to make that movie now? And now you do some half-hearted movie. And that's the problem with those small budget movies that people don't trust them anymore because they, they, they're trash. Like, let's say, what is Steven Seagal, for example? People are saying, they know that before even putting it on, it's going to be shit. You know, because none of the money are being put, it's a scam. It's a scam for people to get paid. That's it. So I think now we do have great opportunity for small budget movie to shine. I think that there's a lot of people for looking for new things. Uh, and now it's our responsibility to put all the money, all of our energy, and to try to to shine through it. Do you think that, because uh, I've talked to a lot of indie filmmakers, and there here's, here's the thing, and I told you before uh, earlier that I, I, I like to find the hidden gems, because there's a, there's a lot of beautiful films out there, shows as well, too, that no one's ever heard of. And it's and I I, sh I shouldn't say it's to sound naive because because I, I know it will I will sound naive for saying it but I'm surprised that people haven't discovered it yet because there are quality uh, work out there that are done by independent filmmakers that do it virtually with no budget and the standard is unbelievable mm -hmm. to the point where I've talked to a director by the name of Kyle Kawika Harris who directed a movie called Out of Exile and the star of that film is a, a gentleman by the name of Adam Hampton both great filmmakers. But when I found out, you know, what the budget was for Out of Exile, and then when I talked to Adam, who's the star of that film, he made a show called um, Rough Cut. It's a, it's available for free on YouTube. I always tell people you got to watch the show; it's really good. But it's it's when I found out with Adam that the show was made with virtually no budget, all voluntary work, and for it to come out the way that it did, I remember the same thing. If those guys can do films like that at no cost. Um, there should be no excuse why there's shitty films out there, shitty TV shows, shitty acting, and all that, all the stuff that people will would have these preconceived notions that would have these expectations that it's a no budget film is going to be terrible. But when you watch that, when you watch the show in the film, you're like, this movie comes out, this show in the films come out beautiful, far superior than a lot of stuff we're getting in mainstream. Not to say that a lot of mainstream stuff aren't very good. There's a lot of good stuff out there, but but when I'm watching that. And you see the amount of work they're they're investing into the craft. I I'm blown away that people are missing that, and they want other things that I understand is appealing. Because I think you said it best as well too. It's all about you know let's bring in the people we want and keep everyone else out of it. That part I do understand, which is why when I when I ask a lot of filmmakers about who they work with here, why they work with the same people over again, because they always have a great great relationship. But every once in a while, they're bringing new people into the circle too to help expand more or less the the creativity flow, if you will. But which is a very difficult thing to do, so because it's it, they're very protected by it, and I understand why. But what's in, what's what I find very difficult for me to accept now is that because the 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 audience has has obviously I would say got wiser, maybe the wisest pro proper word to use, but I think more aware of what's going on now that the indie stuff that someone is known for and then they get an opportunity to direct a marvel film or to act in a you know a major property of that sort and then that one person gets the opportunity but if it fails it's, it's stripped from them like that and that's that is the nature of the business but i think a lot of people don't realize that because it, the film didn't fail because of the director the studio interfered and they had so much of uh, to say where they it turned out the way that it did because you're you're seeing that for yourself in both sides of the spectrum, in independent, in the major studios, um, I think you've answered my question before. So forgive me if I'm asking this again, but I'm but I'm actually just curious about that part of the politics for yourself when you see that. Um, I know you mentioned before that it's a little, it's a little frustrating, but you know you you work with what you got and you and you do what you can to do the best of your ability. But when you're seeing that for yourself in the beginning and where things are now in, in both sides of the spectrum for major studios and independent studios. Um, have you noticed for yourself the change as far as how things are being handled, where do you see a, a trajectory where things are going to start to turn out for the better, where smarter decisions are being made to have the money spent on things that are necessary rather than things that are unnecessary. Where you talked before about millions of dollars are being spent on things that are not probably for people just to, just to cover their costs for whatever, but I'm wondering if you if you happen to notice anything that would that would give you a perception that because I saw this in this side and I'm also seeing this on that side, looks like things are going to change a little bit for the better, as long as we keep consistent with that. Because it seems like whenever I talk to people who are in the industry, whether it be independent or major studios, that 
they have to start their own production company and do things from the ground up themselves to get the work that they want. It's harder for them, but it seems like it's worth it because they've started building a momentum for themselves. Um, so I'm not sure if you happen to notice that where things may be changing in either side of the field where if you notice that there is a there is going to be a better change for the industry when it comes to how people are, are given opportunities and where the money's being spent as a result of you know the previous uh efforts they made beforehand i mean it, it takes time it takes yeah. time for the business to change but you were talking about small independent movie in fact just before working with uh, thomas jane i watched one of his more recent films and there is a film that he's done i can't remember the title of it because it's got two different titles um oh it came out last year right uh i think a couple of years ago when he plays a cop and uh, i think it's a movie that was shot for about three million dollars it is great. It's a film that we've seen many times with a rookie cop going out with the older cop. We've seen it all. And, you know, they tell him, kid, listen, you know, take it easy. And it, they go through the night like that. And through the night, they're going to go and see through a um, dirty cop that take cocaine and going crazy. And other. It's a pretty good movie. It's very well shot. It's very well done. And I think that movie costs $3 million. Um, um, and it, it was a pretty good movie. So I was very impressed. So it goes to show with very little money, you got to. You can't do a movie. You just got to know in advance that what's happening. Sometimes in those movies, as I say, they promise you five, six, seven, and on the day they say, "Well, you only get a third of that." So now you got this script, and you're like, "Oh, okay. What am I going to do?" The also the other problem that I find uh, that I've seen in small budget movie is you got two type of actors. Um, they're going to get actors to obviously lead that movie. They're going to be able to put on a poster because. Uh, you know, when people go through the channel on on, on a demand movie, they're going to click on face they recognize. Yeah, and you got two type of actors. You got the actors that don't give a shit about it anymore. You know, so they just show up on a day and they just don't care and they don't know the lines. So something that you should have shot in half a day, now you're going to have to shoot it all day because they don't know the lines. So they're learning the line as they're doing the take. So you're going to do them over and over and over. So now you're going to spend all day shooting that, and you're going to end up with movies and that's what you see now when it's just two people talking in a room and nothing else and the reason why is because they don't have time to shoot nothing else or you got the other actors that do care because they don't want to be doing that forever they want they want to go back to the uh, first league and they still don't want to take all day to shoot it because they want to look the best so they're going to ask for close-up they're going to ask for a medium shot they're going to ask to do it over and over again because they didn't feel that take and it's the same thing so sometimes you got to make sure that you cast, they're on the board with you. Nobody cares if you call this actor that everybody knows and all you guys, two people talking in a room about nothing. People are clicking on the movie to see some action, to see something happening, you know? So that's, that's one thing that I wanted to say that I see a lot in those movies. As for the politic, yeah, the politic always existed and I was very well aware. What I was right. aware from day one is, let's face it, the acting game is mainly for rich people. Okay. I don't know how it's like in America. In LA, it's different than New York. Okay. The politics is slightly different. But let me tell you here in the UK, what happened most of the time, you see some of those actors and actresses, they go in those very expensive private school. Um, and at the end of it, they're going to join drama school. So the fact that they come from, you know, a rich background and already done, they went through those post school, allowed them to go to those big drama school. And at the end of those big drama school in the final, they have big agents that are going to take them on board and they're already going to be put forward for major TV show and lead role. So um, I know I'm being, being um, how do you say, generalist. Sometimes you do have people that can get, go through the gaps. No. But it's often like that. You know, if you look for the BBC, if you look at most of the big, you know, casting director and big agent, they all went through, you know, uh, be the, all the posh schools, you know, in the UK, so they all kind of know each other. It's a bit like politics, you know. Mm -hmm. So I always knew that, and you can say the same thing about Paris and stuff like that. It's, it's mainly rich people. Um, but now what happened on top of it is the politic. And it might not be the politic that people expect me to say. Now, because there's so many platforms, there's so many movies made for platforms, different TV show, VOD, cinema, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's never been so many projects made from movies to TV shows. And a lot of people get into Hollywood because there's a lot of money to make. They could have gone and worked for a tennis shoe company or a soft drink, or soft drink company, but they went in, in Hollywood because, well, I can make some money in that. And now you realize then 
after a certain level, these people, regardless of how good they are, they're always going to make money as long as they please the boss, as long as they please the manager, as mm -hmm. long as they please the people above them. And all of these people don't get paid based on how much the movie make. They get paid regardless. They make the money. As, as starting at one point, they don't care. They're going to make the money. Even if the movie don't make any money, they're still going to make money next year. Some people get paid millions of dollars every year doing nothing. So this politic go bigger and bigger and bigger to the point that now all the people think about is the politic within Hollywood. They want to climb the ladder. They don't care about the movie they're making anymore because they don't like the movie they're making. You know, as I said, most of those people, they come from a different background than you and me. They're not proud to say they do action, the action movie or superhero movie. You know, within the group, within the society, they're not proud of saying that. That's why they're so heavy on the politic because they want to say, oh, yeah, you see what I've done there. You know, so all they care about is making money. They climb the ladder and they just focus on that. And, and they don't care about the audience. The audience, they're kind of annoying. They're just there, but they're not the one paying the salary. They're kind of toxic. And this mentality spread out so much that now even the actor, the showrunner, and the director behave the same way. They're supposed to promote a TV show and they're telling to the potential audience that they are toxic. I'm like, what are you on about? Are you not trying to sell the show? No, because that's the politic within inside the business. They don't care about the audience anymore. Most of these people in Hollywood, they're not here because they're passionate about it. They're just here because it's a way for them to make money and to gain power. So the people that love making movies, they're just, they're just a very tiny percentage in Hollywood. And to them, most of the time, they're just annoying. They're irritating. Same. So in you a small budget movie, we don't have as much this problem anymore. That's right. why it was great for me to work with Jesse because I recognize myself in Jesse. He loves movies. Right. I could see that all the shot he was trying to make. And that's another thing. When you have a very small budget, you got to be ready to rumble, man. Right. This is going to be a war. You know, only, we only got like two to three weeks to shoot these things. You're not going to have no tea break. You're not going to be hanging around. You're going to have to be quick to change the light, to, to get the right lens. You're going to be, you know, me. I need to know all my choreography, fighting-wise. I need to do all my light dialogue for the whole movie. Because if they say, hey, you know what? This afternoon, we're going to shoot that scene. We're not going to shoot it next week. I need to be ready to rumble. And tell, let me tell you something. On one Ranger, more than one time, I only had one take. Jess, you got one take on that one. You better get that shit right. Yeah. You better be ready. So you need to be ready in those things. And if your crew are ready, then with a small amount of money, we can do something that looks bigger. I haven't seen one Ranger yet. I don't know what it looks like. But it's usually good. those, those like things it. that you do in such a short amount of time, usually they look very flat. They look mm -hmm. like an, an old school TV show. You yeah. know? But I could see that on a day, JC was just quickly changing camera, trying to shoot with two, trying to get some close-up, trying to get some something going, trying to get the light walking here. And because I could see he was doing that, I was giving him back and trying to create a character even more and be very, you know. So I, that's why I really love making that film with him. But that's not often like that. You know, I did another movie this year and it's like, ah. Oh. They show the same scene from every single angle we can think of. We can clearly see that the director has no imagination whatsoever. They're shooting this shit from every angle. They're going to give it to an editor. They're going to do whatever he wants. And that's just demoralizing. What's a, what's one experience? And if, if you, you don't have to name the film if you don't want to, but what's the one experience you've made a movie where you really felt like, okay, th that this was this is the reason why I want to make films like the experience of working with the cr the crew where you guys were literally on board with virtually everything you guys were working on, maybe some disagreements, but you guys came to a, you know, to, to me in the middle, in the middle where the experience for you, uh, it was exactly how you would anticipate what filmmaking should be like, where you have a lot of creativity. Uh, you have a lot of input from various people. They all talk with each other. And then when you made the project, whether it turned out good or not, but the experience was good enough that made you realize that this is why we make films. And then when you see the movie, hopefully it came out really well. But I'm wondering if you've ever had that experience that gave you that feeling of this is why we do it. I'm going to give you two answers. In fact, I'm going to start with a question you didn't ask. I'm going to ask. I'm going to start with the one that I like the least. And I did a film called Maleficent 2. And I did oh, an audition yeah. for that. Yeah. And when I did the audition, I had some dialogue and everything. And then they called me. They said, you got a job. I was like, great. I got a job. Now, I got to go there. They picked me up in my house at 2.30 in the morning because I've got five hours of makeup every day. 
when I arrive on a job, I've got no makeup. In fact, I've got 20 actors around me that did the same audition as me. And they all had to do the same dialogue. And all have been told they have the job. I'm only being used to be in a background. You know? So I'm, I'm, I'm like an actor. They pick me up. I've got a trailer. But really, I'm just there in the background. And I've done that for six weeks. For six weeks, pick up at 2.30 in the morning, five hours on makeup every day just to be in the background. And that kind of irritated me so much that at that point, that's when I started doing a little bit of stunts. Because I was like, you know what? Fuck this. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to do stunts because I want to be taken seriously as an actor. But now you're not taking me seriously anymore. So I might as well fucking do whatever. Mm -hmm. And that's why I started doing you know, stunts. Now, the good thing and the worst thing about the good experiences, the best experience I've ever had and did what you just said, kind of said, wow, I really like that. And, you know, I got a lot of saying in my, in my, in my character was my first ever movie as a lead character. It was a film called One Shot, um, uh, sorry, uh, Night Fair. Ten years ago, I did a film called Night Fair. It's a French action thriller, but we speak like 50% French, 50% English in it. It's available, I think, uh, in Netflix. It wasn't available on Netflix for a while in America. Uh, I think it's still on Amazon for free. And uh, I play a, a taxi driver, and you got those two guys coming in my taxi, and they do a runner. And then I'm kind of like a boogeyman, kind of like a Jason type when I'm going to run after them all over Paris and kill people along the way. Um, and it's very star sterilized. It's very it, this movie cost 800 grand, but you wouldn't think. It's very beautifully shot. It's great. It's a fun movie. You should check it out. And, uh, What's the movie and called again? Night Fair. Night Fair, okay. And, uh, and it was a great experience. Sam, great communication with the director, Julien Seri. Um, I was talking a lot about the character. Initially, it was just supposed to be a shadow uh, with a hat. And you would just, just see me kind of like the well. But it, Sam, I was doing stuff. was like, wow, I really like what you do. And then, then he started putting a bit more lights on me. And then now you start seeing me properly. And then he's like, okay, now, now I need to start. And need, we did reshoot because he wanted to have a background about my character now. So now we did reshoot. And at the end, we explained where my character come from. So that was great. And that was my first kind of co-starring. And by that time, I was only acting for about four years. So I went from small little job, being an extra, working pop videos and short films, to, hey, now I'm co-starring. It was my face in the poster in the underground in Paris. That film got released all over the world, even in Asia and Japan and everything. So it was like, hey, Hollywood, here I come. Yeah. And then after that, bam, no work for two years, and then yeah. reality kicked in. So, um, so yeah, but from then, from the beginning, for my first ever real role, I had a great experience. When you th when you think about yourself now, because uh, I've asked this question before, because but I'm because I'm always curious about what people's perspective is about themselves up to this point, um, because of the highs and lows you've been through, and I'm talking about your your career in general, MMA, stunt work, uh, acting, the whole the whole nine yards. Uh, I think before you talked about that, you're you're happier. You you are happy with where you are with yourself now, if I recall correctly. But you know, if 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 let's say it comes to the point right now where you this is a hypothetical but let's say you're you're not getting any more work anymore you're you're the the, the work start coming the, the auditions are stopped they're no, no longer being offered you're not uh being sought out but if that were to happen um if you look back at yourself now and see all the things you've accomplished here what, what, is that something you think you look about look at yourself and say you know what despite the fact that I've been through all this here, highs and lows, and there's no more opportunity at this point, I can still look back at myself and look at my career and say, I am proud of what I've done because I stay true to myself. Because un understanding this business, you talked before that there for a period of two years, you weren't getting any work. So obviously that, might, that had to mess with you a little bit where am I going to be able to continue this because I want to pursue this, but it's, nothing's coming out of here. So I'm wondering if you know if if that were to come. I hope it never does, but I'm asking if it, if it were to come, would you think you look back at yourself and say, "I'm happy with what I've been able to accomplish here, and I have no regrets, and therefore, whatever new endeavor I decide to pursue at this point here, um, I'm going to make the best of it as well too, because I've got to make the choices that I've made, and I'm happy with the decisions I've made up to this point." You know, I hear a lot of fighter now all day talking about the legacy, right? And I never thought about that in my life. Me, I'm like, everything I do is for myself. Right. And I'm just looking forward. And then we'll look back. 
you know, people think, oh, what do you think about your career? I'm like, my career is yesterday. I don't even think about it. Anymore. I don't even think about fighting anymore. It's just, it's what I've done. It's, it took me to where I am here and it gave me tools to do what I do today. Right. But I just don't look back. And 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 let's say acting stuff, I'm not going to look back. I'm not going to look back and say, oh, actually, you know what? I enjoy that role that I've done. It's like, no, I just look back. I look forward. I look forward. Let's just move on. That's it. You know, it's done. It's done. Like I said to you in the beginning, mm-hmm. you know, I'm staying true to myself. What I like about acting is acting. It's nothing else. It's when I'm on a day, I'm acting. That's what I like. So when am I going to look back, look back on what? You know, it's, you know, if I stop, I stop. The way I don't like it anymore, the day I don't enjoy doing the acting anymore, I just move on. What happens if someone comes up to you and says, uh, Jess, uh, you know, I saw a movie that you did and I want you to watch it with me because I love, I love the film, but I want to watch it with me. I want you to watch it with me. Would you ever do that? Or are you, are you also in the position where, uh, you know, I don't like to go back and revisit the work. I just, I, well, let's watch yeah, what the Okay. Yeah, it's fine. I can. <laughs> I can. The same way. Listen, as I said, my fighting career has been going up and down. Like right. I already explained to you, I'm not going to get back into it again. Right. But I can easily look back and say, oh, yeah, this guy kicked my ass, but, you know, he should have no. You know, but I don't have this anger in me. I can see fighters, they really have a lot of resentment. You know, they, right. they know that they lost that fight, but if they would have trained harder, they should. Me, I'm like, yeah, sure. I should have never lost to that guy, but hey, it is what it is. You know, right. I just move on. So if someone wants to watch a movie, we're like, yeah, sure, okay. And, you know, but I probably laugh about it and tell you, oh, you know, this is what I did here and stuff like that. Or do a commentary of it and stuff like that. I don't mind. <laughs> that's fine. You know, as I said. <laughs> well, it's funny you brought about because I, cause I don't think I was leaning towards that angle about legacy because I actually asked somebody, uh, I, asked, I was asking uh, uh, who's a director now, Devaney Penn, uh, about the importance of legacy for her because I'm in the same position as yourself because I – um. I, I don't necessarily I don't really care about what other people will think about me. I just I, I, I like and this is this here. I, I enjoy this very much. I, I love talking to people, but I'm specific about what I'm looking into for a person that I want to speak with. And uh, I think a lot of people may get the uh, the idea that if I say I've talked to people who are in the inter- entertainment industry, and I have talked to some actors that most people are well known with here, but um, but there's a perception about, you know, who have you spoken with and what did I do for you personally? And I was like, well, what it did for me is that I got to learn a lot about them, but what they've also have, uh, shared with me, made me learn a lot about myself because there's a perspective about what, what I want to get into with you about legacy, which is that I don't necessarily, I don't really care for that myself either, but I find it interesting for those that do care about that, where they see like, you know, what I do, what I do here, if someone were to look back and say, um, what has what have I done? I hope they would say that they did great movies or they did this really well. I understand that. And I can respect that as well too. But, um, but at the end of the day, you know, when it comes to legacy, uh, there's a lot of things that I think a lot of people don't really care to look into unless you have, unless you're Steven Spielberg, who is, whose films have impacted a lot of people for reasons that they would explain, explain why it was so important for them. But, you know, at the end of the day, I don't know who Steven Spielberg is. I just like his movies. And that's all I really care about. But when you start sharing about, you, you know, you don't think about the past and you're only looking forward here. Um, that's interesting for me because I'm I'm always curious about why, um, if you don't go back and reflect, uh, I, I, I understand what that means for you because I guess because I'm, I'm looking at a perspective like of mistakes you may have made. I'm not asking you to delve into your details about your past. I'm just more asking about like, I didn't do a good job in this role, but so I know that I, because I've been able to look back at it, I know what I can do better moving forward. And you've already answered the question that, you know, if people are telling you on the set, that was really good. Okay, that's good enough for me. That's my confirmation. Move forward at that point. But I was also talking to somebody else in uh, Natalia who was telling me that she doesn't look back at her work, but she seems like the type of person. And you strike me the same way too, that if you look back and say, okay, this is what I need to do to get better. Now I know what I have to do to improve on those areas. I find that to be fascinating because you do strike me as a person that would do your due diligence to revisit yourself, to fix the things you think you need to work on. But the fact you're saying, once I'm done, I move forward there. And I don't, I don't think about looking back. I find that interesting. So I'm wondering where that came for yourself. And if that's something you've always had that, that you've developed for yourself to, to look forward in that capacity, or if that's something you have learned along the way where you've learned to let go of certain things and not hang on to them. So that way it doesn't either pull you back or whatever those just may be, because I, I always feel like someone like yourself is the type of person that would reflect on it 
And once you have time spent on it to figure out what works and what didn't work, then you're able to move forward from that because you had the time to uh, let her simmer in and then be able to uh, handle yourself either better or whatever the case may be. So I, I know I'm rambling on here, but I hope you understand why I'm, uh, I was getting into it with you because I find that really interesting that you pointed that out there, that you don't look back, but you always stick looking forward here. And I'm wondering why you don't do because that. Because I run away from my childhood because from a very young age, my dad used to beat me up very badly, my mother as well. Uh, I used to have, uh, then we ran away, then we were homeless for a while. We lived in a church, then we live in a hurry. I was very rough, so I was fighting every day. Um, by the age of 20, I just moved away f- from everything and just took a t- one-way ticket to Houston, Texas, and lived there without any green card, doing a whole bunch of walks. So I'm not going to get too much into details, but basically, I always run away from my past. So I always look forward. I never look back. And that's what allowed me to keep walking, keep going. I don't want to look back. I don't want to look back at the pain. I don't want to look back at the suffering that I ever had. So I think that's part of it. I always look forward. I don't want to stop and look back. Now, as for my acting, you know, in martial art, uh, when you're a fighter or even a practitioner, a lot has to do with yourself. You can have the best teacher in the world. You still have to do the work and you have to make sure that it works for you. Maybe because of your height is different or your weight, or maybe your age, or maybe you're not quite as flexible, or maybe you're not quite as athletic. So you're going to find a way for it to work for you. So yeah, the instructor can show you something, but you got to figure it out yourself. And me, I would say that 80% of the stuff i ever done in martial art, I kind of figure out myself. I would watch other fighters doing things and kind of figure out what they were doing. I remember when I started wrestling and grappling 25 years ago, and people would catch me on the leg lock. I was like, how did you do that? And he would show it to me. Then I would spar with him, and I would catch him on a, with the same move. So I kind of like to figure things out myself. And that's what I did with acting. I've done some classes, but I figure out how acting works for me by using different techniques. And what I was doing initially, when I was much, you know, in my beginning, I would act. I would act scene. And I would look back on some of the stuff at the time, because I was curious and I didn't like what I was seeing because I could see that I was acting. I don't act anymore. I make choices in the beginning and I leave the moment. So if the acting is not good, it's because my initial choices weren't good. Because me, when I'm on set, I'm not acting. I'm leaving the moment. Interesting. So that's why I don't want to look back on it because it was not that I did some wrong acting choices because I'm not acting in that moment. Is because my initial choices weren't right for that role and what the director wanted. So then, I got, I, that's what it's down to that initial conversation with him. The last thing I want to see is me on the day acting. And that's what I said to you when I see sometimes mm-hmm. actors and actresses acting like sitcom. I see them acting. I can see them picking that thing from their back pocket and pretending to be surprised. You know what I mean? And all those things. I mean, they're not doing it like that. But you see what I'm saying? <laughs> I know you're they, saying. They're, not, they're not there. I, I can see saying. their eyes. They're not there. As for me, I want to be there. I want to be in the moment. That's why when I've got a protagonist or an antagonist in front of me, I don't want to talk to them. I don't want to be friendly with them. Uh, we can have a quick chat and stuff like that. But on the day, I'm not going to be talking to you, man. I, I'm not one of those guys that say, cut. So anyway, uh, did you see that thing last night? No, that's not me, brother. You know what I mean? Oh, I I, I'm, I'm not a method actor either. Right, I can't right. really define what I do, but I'm in the moment. So what I'm saying is looking back in the film, say, oh, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, you know, yeah, that, that was not very good because I didn't use the right technique. No, 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 no. Because no, no. on that day, I was not using no technique at all. That's very interesting. What's actually... Um... What's actually a part that you have taken on that took the most out of you that that made you that actually pushed you to your limits? Do you have uh, do you have a part that ever did that for you? Yeah, that's what I see. Also, I, I try different technique, and when I did Night Fair, uh, there is one scene that we shot, and at one point, I've got this scene when you learn about my background, and I've got a disagreement with my wife, and I'm being physical with my wife. And I've been bringing back some of the things that my father was doing to my mother and stuff. And I tried to get into that. It was very hard, very well powerful. And I, those tears wanted to come out my eyes. And I was holding them as I was frustrated. And, and the assistant director comes to me and says, I didn't know you could do that. Uh, but I was like bringing real things on my life there in a the moment. And it was extremely, it was a long night. It was very painful. You know, when... At one point, I can't explain it. It was hurting my chest, and it was like, 
giving me a headache at one point. I was not liking it. And I stopped doing that. I stopped taking things for my real life. I'm constructing all the character beforehand. Beforehand, I'm taking all those things about this guy. I'm creating something. I'm knitting this guy. And then on the day, I'm going to put that jumper on. I'm this guy. But that's nothing to do with me. And then I'm you bring some stuff of you without realizing. Right. Without realizing. It's still you, you know. But I'm not bringing personal things into my acting anymore. I hope this is a fair question to ask you because there, because you, you actually point out some stuff that's really, really interesting about your approach with the acting. But and, and again, I hope this is a fair question to ask because when you when you start you start talking about the the some of the, your your experiences that you brought into that specific role for uh, Night Fair. Night Fair. Yeah. Yes, thank you. And. I and you talked about how you like to prepare to make sure you've done your due diligence for the respective part for the film or whatever it is you're working on here. The question I want to ask was that, you know, there's there's a part of me that that wonders if you are more or less creating a world that you would have liked to have lived in through the characters that you're going to play. If that makes any sense, it's nothing like that at all. Okay, no. Okay, so that's what I was just curious I can about. see people to do that. I can see right. all those want to be action star around me that I've got within my circle. And you can see them, you know, always taking pictures with the biceps up and doing, right, right. they want to be those alpha men. I've always that guy. I <laughs> fucked people up in a cage when it wasn't trendy. <laughs> so I I I don't want those people's character. And, and and I mean, let's face it, also I play bad guys most of the time. So who mm. wants to be a bad guy? You know, but what I want is to bring humanity to them. That's what I always, I'm always fighting for. I want this person to be human. I don't want to play that evil guy. That's why you saw that thing in um, in one, one shot. shot. Yeah. Because I made him human. I want him to be a human. I don't know where it came out One Ranger because I haven't seen it. But One Ranger, I'm not this. I, yeah. I think I'm I'm communicating like human. I think in fact I think in One Ranger, I hope he came through. I've got some sort of sense of humor. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I I actually want to bring this up to you about the movie because this because I almost forgot to bring it up here. But I have seen the movie a few times, um, and I'm actually going to be doing a review as, as if this recording to have it uploaded on the channel that I work with here. There is a reason. One of the reasons I did want to talk to you too was because there was a there was a humorous part in the film um, that I remember um, actually made me laugh out loud, out loud because it was one of those weird situations where. Um, it was a scene where you and Thomas Chain uh, meet up again after you had your initial fight with him in the in early in the part of the film. And um, you had walked into the room and I believe he had knocked out uh, Dominic's character as well. And you sat down, you asked, can you hand me a napkin, please? And, he, and you're like, I have something in my eye. Yeah. And then he brings you the napkin. For some reason, I thought that was such a really um, humorous scene. Not that it was laugh out comedy, but it was just mm -hmm. like one of those like, Funny things that the the littlest things that I thought you brought to that character, which was the class, if you will, of the character. Like, hey, excuse me, can you please give me that? Just after you knocked out a woman and sat down and asked politely to the man who you're about to get into a fight with, hey, little nuances like that. I remember distinctly what I really enjoyed about your character. And the one thing I remember too about the film is that yes, you did point out before about um, the the humor that you brought to the to your character, and that is a hundred percent true. And it does show in the film, at least it did for me personally. And I hope people pick up on that as well, too, because um I'm not sure how much of uh how much of the character as far as the comedy scenes was already written in the film. For um, me it was written. For me it okay. was written. I mean, okay. when I come in the room, it's like, have you stopped shooting my man? Yeah. It's becoming very difficult to find gunmen. Right, right. You shoot all of them. What am I right. gonna do? <laughs> that, that, that's that's fun. Right. Isn't it? What, what how else do you want me to play that be humorous about it? Well, I you think know? it's funny that you actually remember that line verbatim because that's exactly what you said in the film. You know, <laughs> so the fact how, that how you want me to be that. have you stopped shooting <laughs> my man? I mean, uh, how else they can this can only be comedy for me when I read it. This right. guy was fun. In fact, when we did the table reading, everybody was laughing when I was doing my line. So I was like, I'm into something here. In fact, that scene that you've seen is initially much longer, and you've learned a lot more about my character. And I'm explaining to uh, Thomas James why I'm doing this job. Right. Because he's asking me, what, why are you doing this? And I'm explaining to him why and what my relationship is with uh, McBride. Obviously, the scene's been cut, but from what I've heard on the Blu-ray, 
uh, is going to be as a deleted scene. So the old scene would be on a Blu-ray available. So it's a much longer scene. Yeah. So, I think that movie, um, it's interesting because it's, when, when I saw that film, there was a lot of, there's a lot of um, things that I pull out from it. But one of, I told Jesse from the beginning and when I talked with him last week about the film that, you know, to me, that is more or less a personality of Jason when it comes to the American culture that he grew up watching and the films he loved watching and now him being in America and understanding the culture, understanding the history, and then be able to use the British backdrop, <clears throat> given his respective background, to be able to you know, succinct the story together. And the one thing I, I always remember with Jesse, too, was that uh, he's one of those directors, and maybe you can uh, add on to this as well, was that whatever's going to take for the actors or the writers to make the film better, I'm all for it. So if the actors want to do something that's going to make it, to make the scenes work, let them do their job. Because he even said himself too, sometimes I don't even direct the actors. They just do it. All I have to do is put the camera in place and they just do the, they do the rest of the work. And, you know, he pointed out before that Tom uh, was already putting on the accent, didn't really interact with Jesse all that much on set. He, he was like one of the very, he says the only actor I've ever worked with that I worked the least with on set. Everyone else I always have a conversation with, but Tom was the one that kept him so, to himself the most. And then on the last day of the, of the shoot, he's right back with his normal, you know, uh, accent if you will so it sounds like to me when you worked on that film that you got to work with because i know jesse is a is a, is a, 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 a film lover but it sounds like to me with working with jesse that you know you being a film lover, i'm sure everyone on the set is a film lover but something specific about jesse for me that i always gravitate to is that he understands the history about what he's putting into the film um that more or less you may have picked up along the way too so i'm actually really curious about your experience working with him and what really made you, and that part, not, apart from the fact that he tried to, he, I'm sorry, that he offered you the part, but I wonder specifically what made you realize that working with him was going to be a good idea considering what, you know, what you've read in the script, your interaction with him that made you realize that I, I know right now that I'm, we're going we're, we're, we're to be in good hands, work with this man because he's going to give me the opportunity to do whatever I need to do to uh, excel the character, if you will. Well, first of all, when he contacted me and offered me the role, I was surprised. And then the first thing I did is to watch uh, Avengemen that he's done with Scott Atkins. Right. And I was like, oh, shit, that's pretty good. That's probably one of the best Scott Is Atkins. that the first one you saw? Is the first time yeah. you saw the movie? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I've never seen it before. Um, uh, so I was like, wow, okay, that's that guy's pretty good. And then I read the script and... Uh, I said, which role do you want me to play? Uh, he said, Oleg. I was like, oh, okay, cool. And I was like, ah, oh, that's actually quite a meaty role. That's quite a fun role. That's something I really can have fun with. But as I said, I wanted to make sure that we were on the same point. But then when I talked to him and I could see, you know, when you talk to another movie lover, is the type of conversation you're going to have. You, you you don't talk about the same thing about movies. You talk, like I said, about specific scene, about right. specific show, about something. I'm like, okay, me and him, we're talking the same language here. You know, I, you know, I know that I'm in good hand. I know that he's going to shoot me properly. I know that he's going to respect my character. And we did, we did a couple of different on set. You know, a couple of times we didn't, you know, we, we had a bit of an argument, but, you know, it's the heat of the moment also because, we, as I said, we're shooting an awful lot, you know, and, you know, oh, sorry, Jess, we don't have time to shoot you today. Oh, you know, the following day, oh, sorry, we don't have time to shoot you again. Oh, okay, we only got time, only one take. You know, and eventually I start saying, hold on a minute, I didn't sign up to be a henchman here. I signed up to be a fully fleshed character, you know, so I want to make sure that I'm getting my shots, you know. I mean, here I think I'm having a moment. I want to close up. Was like, oh, we don't need a close up. I, like, I want a close up. If I don't get a close up, uh, I'm not moving on to the next scene. And I don't think that that was the right approach for me. But at the time, I was very frustrating with a lot of things happening. In all fairness, we don't really need that fucking close up anyway. Uh, but I was scared. <laughs> so he was right. He was right. And he did say to me at the end of the show, uh, "Hey, uh, Jess, we're getting you close up. The close up you wanted. Now, are you happy?" I was like, "I didn't ask for a fucking close up for my ego." You know, I just want to be respected as an actor. But I think he, he got so it was it. just a principle for you yeah. at that point. Yeah, I didn't yeah. want to be reduced to a henchman. And I could see like I a lot of time was spent on on, yeah. on some other shots and stuff like that. A lot more time was spent on other shots, which I wasn't involved with. And and sometimes I was not the only one who was a little bit frustrated. And at one point I was like, okay, uh, I, I don't want to be... And also other other things behind the scene as well that was happening, like the credit of some actors moving up and down, the politics behind it with the agent. 
And I was like, well, hold on a minute, what's going on here? Uh, and then I remember one time also he, he referred me as McBride's uh, henchman. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Me and McBride, we're a team. I'm not his henchman. You know, things like that, you know, but nothing major. You know, I think that's the only thing that happened between me and and, and JC um, on that day. But one thing that I knew is, is I did trust him as a director because, as I said, Besides anything, he's a movie lover. And and me, what I want to work is people that are... And it's so rare. It, it feels weird to say, but I want to work with people that love movies, that love the job, that want to do the best. And when I was doing a scene, and I would pop my head, and I would see JC doing the replay, and I would see him with a big grain, you know, very happy. I was happy. I was like, that's great. I'm doing my job. Interesting. What's actually uh, one of the best advice you've ever gotten from a director that actually changed the way you approach with your preparation it was there it, can you recall of any time that actually stuck out for you in that capacity not really no, no? Okay. as i said uh, most act most directors sometimes they let you do your thing you know um i've never really been as i said i haven't played i think this, that's the sort of conversation you have when you play many leading roles you know or big important roles you know um I haven't had many of those. So a lot of the time I managed to fight my way from, you know, mid, mid, mid credit to higher credit for my performance and say, okay, this guy, let's give him a bit more time. Uh, that's usually what happened. Uh, so I can't really say I'm not going to pretend to be someone I'm not. I'm not, you know, a big fucking Hollywood actor or anything like that. So no, usually I'm asked, I'm asked to do my job. I do my job. I do it fine. And okay, move on. There you go. That's what I get. You know what I mean? If we move on after two takes, I mean, I've done my job. That's it. You know, I didn't really get much, much advice. It's kind of, it's, 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 I'm going to try to figure out how I can say this here because I don't, I don't want to come off as, a, as if though I always know this is going to happen. But every once in a while, I, I would come across some, somebody, I may come across the work. And I said this before, I, if I can connect with their work, that's, that's the starting point for me. If I can connect with them outside of their work, then I know there's an opportunity that there may be a great conversation we could have. You're one of those people that I've come across where it's like I said before when I when I first came across you um, after years of you know you uh, last fought in in the UFC, um, you just had a familiar face that I just I knew I've seen you from somewhere and then I already explained the story how what had happened. But when I had connected with your performance in One Shot and then. Having learned what Jesse had shared about your preparation for Oligan One Ranger, um, something for me clicked right away at that point to go back and revisit you again to see more of your background, learn more about your story, and so on. That for some reason I felt like there were, I always feel there's always more to the story, but I always feel like there's something more that the person is doing that I feel like if I if had the opportunity just to be able to pull out further, I can learn a lot about them in the conversation. Because I, as much as I like to, I want to promote One Ranger, I always feel like the best way to promote the movie is just get to know the person. If you get to know the person, um, then I'm hoping that's in incentive enough for whoever's listening or watching would say, I like this person. I'm going to go check out the film rather than having to ask, you know, what was it like working with Jesse Johnson? Oh, he was great. you know. And then mm -hmm. it becomes kind of a curated and generic at that point. There was actually a lot that you have shared that gave me a whole new perspective about you as a person that I've learned beforehand, but I think going more in depth with you in this capacity here gave me a lot more to realize about why I think I connected with you in the first place through your performances and then having listened to your story and how Jeffy shared what he had shared with me along the way. And I've said before this a million times, but I always like to root for the underdogs, the guys that are doing the crap that either no one knows about, but will remember something about them and then be able to look back and say, I saw this guy from this movie or whatever the case may be. Because there's something about you as an actor that I really do appreciate and what you have been able to share with me about how you prepare and how you look at yourself, how you carry yourself along the way too, um, made me appreciate more you as an actor, but also you as a person as well too. And as a result of that, you also have me as a fan as well uh, from being able to see your performances and having this conversation with you and from what I've listened to in the past as well. So I know that there's a lot that you, you, you've you you've uh, been working on that I'm sure you're not able to share here, but I was curious about anything, if there's you would like to more or less uh, have people be on a lookout for that they can check you out here that you are able to share. 
uh, with what you are uh, expected to be coming down the pipeline here, apart from One Ranger, which by the time this episode gets uploaded, it'll be a week after the release of One Ranger. Mm-hmm. We'll have Jesse come, have his episode up this week. But um, but I'm not sure if there's anything you want to say in closing as well, too, uh, apart from that, that you'd like people to be aware of, to be looking out for uh, with your future endeavors here. I mean, there's nothing much for me coming at um, in the future. I mean, it's mainly smaller role, um, like the one in Lyft that's coming out on Netflix in August. So that's the one I did with Kevin Hart, but only got one scene in that. Um, but they were very happy with my scene. So maybe I might just steal the show with one single scene. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm in a Bollywood movie at the end of the year, October, uh, a film called Ganapath with an actor called Tiger Shroff. And same again, I play a small part in there and have a, a couple of fight scenes. Um, and that's about it, really. That's what I've got coming out uh, this year. Um, obviously, not much audition. But if people want to go back and look at my work, obviously, you mentioned uh, One Shot and also Night Fair. As I say, I think Night Fair is available on most platform. And um, it's a little bit different. It's shot in Paris at night. Um, it's kind of a slasher. Uh, with a bit of twist to it. So if people want to see me in that, it's kind of a fun movie as well. Okay, cool. Well, listen, I really do appreciate your time, Jess, because I know you're five hours ahead of me. So I appreciate you giving the opportunity to speak with me uh, at this late time of the day here for you because um, that this really does mean a lot to me for, for people to do that and give me their time. So for the cameras, I want to say thank you so much for this and I wish you nothing but great success. And if there's anything that you are also working on that, you know, if there's anything that I could do to help out to promote it, please do not hesitate to let me know. I will do everything in my power to do my absolute best to help promote with whatever you're working on here that you would like people to be on the lookout for because I really mean what I said. I, you do have a fan in me because I think with what you're able to, to input with your work does show on the screen as well too, especially with these two films that we're, uh, we're highlighted the most here, One Shot and One Ranger. There's a lot that you do in those respective roles that I think a lot of people can take away from here that they can look at you in a different light that I hope in time will catch on and grant you more opportunities here. So for me, this is me giving your flowers and I want to say thank you for giving me your time as well. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. I think I like to do those kind of things because I remember uh, as an actor, I still watch those interviews and sometimes I learn more about acting by listening to other actors talking about their life experience, right. more about them talking about acting. I want to learn more about them as a person and their personal experience. And sometimes it helps me, especially in the hard time to realize that it's hard for the other people and uh you know, it helps me a lot. So if I can help some younger actor or actresses, thank you very much for the opportunity and for them as well. What a pleasure.